Hey, Garage Gym Athletes, before we get started, I wanted to let you know we are upping our Instagram game so we can better educate the industry. The goal is to drown out the influencers in bro science that is social media. If you want to help, screenshot this podcast episode and tag us at Garage Gym Athlete and a friend in your Instagram stories. We'd love to connect and we will even be sending some free merch to a select few who actually take us up on this 15 second task. So go get it done and I look forward to connecting with you. All right, now to the show. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Garage Gym Athlete Podcast. Jerry Moon here with Joseph and Ashley Hicks. She's here. You thought that she wasn't new, here new anymore. Person, Ashley. That's what everyone was like, where'd she go? But she's here. Um, I think that with that intro, we should start with you, Ashley. Like, what's what's been going on? Where have you been? Um, and welcome back, just for me and, and Joe. So yeah. we'll start with you. How are things? It's good to be here. Um, things are good. We are finally settling in San Antonio. We've been everywhere we went to san antonio our stuff was delayed all you military people that are listening know what i'm talking about it's a good time when uh your stuff gets delayed so instead of sleeping on air mattresses my dad lives up in dallas so we stayed with him for a week and then came back and got our stuff and then anyways so we've been back and forth we've traveled a lot we had some uh family travels and then um I don't think I announced it before I left, but uh, I'm pregnant with baby number two. So <laughs> I've had a hell of a time with this one. <laughs> She's, uh, it's a girl according to the blood work. So who knows? Anatomy scan, it might be a boy, but I don't think so. There's too much drama happening. That boy. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's how you know, I guess. She's yeah. Fired. yeah. <laughs> uh, I've been super sick with this one. So I have not worked out since I think the last time I looked was July, like 15th or something crazy like that. So I've been killing mental toughness in a different way, just trying not to puke every day, but um, it's fine. I'm 16 weeks and hoping it eases up, but hey, if it doesn't, she's healthy and that's the thing that matters. So Just pushing through. I'm sure it'll ease up at some point. I hope that it does for you. Yeah, for sure. I talked to Emily about it and she said hers eased up with Eleanor around 20 weeks. And I was like, means I have a whole more month to go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Hey, end, end is near. Yeah, I think uh, Emily's pregnancy was very different coming from two boys and then go girl. She mm-hmm. she felt quite different. And that was kind of how she knew. She had like the hunch. She was like, oh, this is different. Yeah. And there you go. It was a girl. Yeah, for sure. It's definitely been completely flipped from Connor. Like I had no issues with Connor. So, um, Scott is in Southwest training right now. So he's gone, uh, 97% of the time. (laughs) Uh, but he's enjoying it and, um, it's kind of a chiller pace than anything he's done with the military. So it's kind of cool to see him like be in this new training environment. And he's like, not high stress, not like, he's like, he goes to the pool after his gym workouts. Like he kind of has like this really chill schedule, cush schedule. And he's like, people are freaking out about tests. I don't really know why. And I'm like, you're used to your fighter pilot, crazy, like rigorous schedule, like, and, and having to study that way versus, you know, information that is, you know, just like, what's this button? <laughs> like it's a whole bunch of systems, right? Cause let's be for real. Those planes pretty much fly themselves i didn't say that (laughs) what you're saying Uh is the bar for southwest pilots is really low no i shouldn't have said i think that that would be i think that'd be okay to say compared to a combat aviator in the united states air force like i I think that's all right yeah it's okay i'll say that he probably couldn't even study outside of his building for the f-35 versus uh true southwest it's like yeah whatever take whatever you need home here here's a simulator whatever you know it's just a it's just an they Airbus. They gave him an air p- an iPad and like, yeah. like this crazy stuff. And they were like, yeah, here you go. For sure. Yeah. It is. There's no vaults that he needs to get into. And yeah. So it's, it's pretty good. Um, but he should be done beginning of October, which is crazy how fast the initial training goes. And then he'll be doing kind of part-time between 
reserve in Southwest getting his hours and then he'll be full-time reserve by November. Like it's going to be a whirlwind, you know, but I can't believe September's around the corner. So it's going fast guys. Yeah. A lot of transitions. Yeah. And we're glad you're back. Glad yeah. you're back. Happy At to least be back. for this episode. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, Trampus just really wasn't holding it down with the female perspective. Like <laughs> we tried, but it just—he's not here to defend himself. Getting black. I know, but come on, <laughs> he just—he couldn't, couldn't, couldn't hold it. All right, Joe, he's having a surgery here? to remove something. So I know I shouldn't, uh, shouldn't beat a man <laughs> while he's getting his appendix out. But uh, I think it's okay to say that Ashley has a better perspective on uh, female workings than than Trampus. <laughs> I'm just going to stay quiet these days. You can be what you <laughs> want to be. <laughs> Joe, how's life? That's fine. Nothing. Well, you don't know anything that's going on with me, but I'm just doing a lot of pre uh, prehab uh, wor working out now. It's still a lot of um, the body weight stuff and adding in some more mobility things. And I'm going to start working in starting to use a kettlebell with certain workouts as well. I mean, I was already doing, uh, my, we'll wait best the entire time with no gear just to make it a little harder. So I'm starting to incorporate kettlebell as well, just to have some sort of uh, object that I'm holding and, and weight that I'm actually using for, for certain things, whether it's um, a Russian swing or like today I did um, single, single kettlebell lunges because they're lunges program just, just to have some sort of weight object and, and, and balancing that way. So I can do you just switch very, on yeah, yeah, I did. I did what do 20 on one and then I switched to 20 on the other. And then that's mm -hmm. how I did my sets. Um, so yeah, just I'm very, very slow. I'm not in any rush to get back to the barbell. I mean, it's fine. I I surprisingly don't miss it. It's um doing the strength training that I was doing for so long for over a year, year and a half. Um, I'm fine just doing body weight and, and some kettlebell stuff and uh also getting me a chance to test out some other things that we might be bringing to the programming coming up. Teaser. Maybe that's your body's way of being like we need to slow down for a little bit and do this. I don't know. That's kind of funny hearing you say you don't miss it because I miss it every day. <laughs> I mean, I, um, yeah, I mean, I'm still doing the, I'm still making the body weight stuff hard and wearing a vest and stuff. And I just, I kind of needed to get back to doing those calisthenics and getting the higher rep type of, of fitness in and doing some circuits and uh, just something completely different than lifting heavy and lifting more of just like, supersets and then that's it but this is more of like some circuits um some tempo stuff you know so i think it, i just i just like it feels good and and it's already things are already feeling better and a lot easier like going through like uh, today i did um something without a weight vest for the first time just because it was it was afterwards and it was like wow this is really freaking easy because i'm not wearing a weight vest during this because i'm just so used to because all my i think it was it was air squats there's a circuit with air squats and i did i did it without it because there was air squats and running and all of my air squats before that, what the, whether it's 60 seconds, you know, 100 reps, whatever it was, with a, with, with a vest. But because I was doing a run, I was like, no, what? I'm not going to wear a vest for this. I'll just do the air squats. And I was like, holy crap, that set of 40 was just a breeze. Hmm. So it's nice to get to this. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, I did a half Murph on Saturday um, just because we were low on time. And I hadn't done one with a vest. And it was only a half. But. It's like the opposite of what you just said. I was like, <laughs> I was like, man, it's way harder than I thought. <laughs> these push-ups are like, yeah, a little more difficult um, than, I, than I remember. And it's funny how quickly you can lose those things, but it's also pretty cool how quickly you can get them back. Mm -hmm. um, and I think high repetition calisthenics is something that if it, it's like aerobic conditioning, if you're not doing it on a weekly basis, you're going to lose it fast. And strength comes back pretty fast too. Like I've taken breaks from bar the barbell before and it comes back. And then you always have to ask yourself, like, how strong do I even need to be? Like, where is, where's the line? Like where, where am I just okay with, you know, as opposed to always having to try and get stronger. So, hmm. but, um, that's it. That's also going to be my update. I did a half Murph cause, uh, I don't have much else, uh, going on. Yep, that's it. Well, we can uh captivating. Make, yeah, I know my my life is so interesting. Um it really is kind of boring. It's like just putting in the work consistently. It's not 
sexy. It's not cool. Um, I don't have any cool, like, big life stuff going on like you guys that I'm aware of. Hold on. <laughs> nope. Now I'm good. So, uh. You don't want to talk about your Rubik's Cube stuff? Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. Since you brought it up, I didn't want to pour everybody segue. into it. But, um, I am learning how to do a Rubik's Cube, and I'm really excited about it. Because... <laughs> I always, I've always wanted to be able to do one. I just started yesterday. I'm getting decent at it. Uh, mainly because my oldest son got one. I don't know if he got it at school or whatever. And he's like, I really want to learn how to do this. And I was like, I've never learned, but I will learn so I can teach you. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think he's better than me at it, like just like naturally. <laughs> um, but I feel that's true about everyone and everything. I think everyone's naturally better than me at most things. My only superpower is I'll sit here and learn it a lot more than you will sit there and learn it. And so now I have to edge him out based off of his natural abilities. Didn't come from me. I don't know where he got that. But anyway, Emily. <laughs> yeah, we'll get into the science. Um, it's This is more of a paper. This one's actually really uh, interesting. It's called the 85% rule for optimal learning. Um, and again, not as much of a study as other studies that we cover, but I had a very specific reason on why I wanted to um, go over this one. I'm going to read the abstract. And then I think that we can kind of talk about, uh, you know, overall our thoughts on it and how it can apply to garage gym athletes and specifically your fitness journey, because I think that that's really important. Um, so the abstract is the the opening line is just hilarious. I have to I have to say, I don't know if you guys caught it, but they go, Researchers and educators have long wrestled with the question of how to best teach their clients, be they humans, <laughs> not human, non-human animals or machines. Like they just really had to clarify in that first sentence that educators are teaching humans, not animals or machines, be they humans. It's awesome. That should be the title of this podcast. Question mark. Any, anyway, <laughs> here we examine the role of a single variable, the difficulty of training on the rate of learning. In many situations, we find that there's a sweet spot in which training is neither too easy nor too hard and where learning progresses most quickly. We derive conditions from uh, for the sweet spot for a broad class of learning algorithms in the context of binary classification tasks. For all these stochastic gradient descent based learning algorithms we find the optimal error rate for training is around 15.87 percent or conversely the optimal training accuracy is about 85 percent we demonstrate the efficacy of this 85 percent rule for artificial neural networks used in ai and biologically plausible neural networks thought to describe animal learning. <laughs> so anyway the big picture here that I thought was really interesting, and you can dive into the study. It's free. We'll have it linked in the show notes. I actually thought the study was really awesome, but the coolest part of it to me was they, it's figure five in the study, and they present a flow model for um, learning. And so on the uh, Y axis, they have the challenge level, and it's high, medium, or low. And then on the x-axis, they have a skill level, low, medium, high. And if you're too low on this uh, flow model, then you're going to be bored. So you're not going to be challenged enough, uh, and there's just going to be boredom. And then on the high side is, like, if it's a really low skill but highly challenging, there's going to be a lot of anxiety and stress. But kind of cut across through the middle of that is flow. and uh, we read that book. Um, I forgot the author's name. The book is The Art of Impossible. I think it was Steve, something like that. Um, anyway, The Art of Impossible, really good book. He talks about Coulter. 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 Yeah. K O T L E R. Kotler. I think is it Kotler. We're good. I don't with know last names. Yeah, yeah. You shouldn't be asking me. Um, <laughs> so, you you tell me what it is. Well, anyway, in that book, The Art of Impossible, this guy. His entire job is to research flow. And I find that the very interesting thing that he does. And I think he's got a lot of great work. He's written multiple books on, on the topic. And uh, I think he does a really good job. Uh, but I think that there's a lot to be said when we're talking about this study. Because 
if if you're not challenged enough in anything that you're doing, you are going to be bored and you're going to start to lose interest or maybe you won't try as hard. And how I like translate that to a garage gym athlete is for our more advanced athletes. I feel like they could get to the boredom side of things. Like if you're not finding a way to challenge yourself or put yourself in situations in the gym, in your training to where you're kind of in that flow category, you're going to get bored. And to be honest, once you start getting bored, you might still be going through the motions and punching the clock, but your results are going to stall. And I think this happens to a lot of people. Um, and I, when I say results, I don't mean getting more shredded or, or getting stronger. I, I'm just talking about results in general. Maybe, maybe it's a skill level. Uh, maybe it's, you know, the achievement of something in consistency, like we have daily over decades. Like there's a lot of different things that where your results can, can stall. And then on the other side of things, there can be athletes who take on way too much because they think that they can. And this is where I see a lot of beginners come in and then they're in the, you know, fitness is a relatively low skill, but then it's high, high anxiety because they're trying to take on too much and they can't, they can't manage it all. Um, so that's why I kind of want to talk about it. Just put this in, in context of garage gym athletes a little bit more. Uh, what did each of you think about this study or paper? I think, it took a while for this one to click. And I think it was, it was really when it got to the discussion part that it clicked. And that, that's why I, I highlighted the uh, first two sentences of it. And it said, we found that the rate of learning is maximized when the difficulty of training is adjusted to keep the training accuracy at around 85%. We showed that training at the optimal accuracy proceeds exponentially faster than training at fixed difficulty. So meaning you can't go to learning anything or training something uh, cookie cutter. So what works for you isn't going to work for somebody else. And one thing that that I, I really um, associated with as well was a lot of the studies that we've done on velocity. And um, they whether it's like there's some studies that we've had, like there's they're measuring velocity or a coach is, is watching them and they have them do a rep scheme until they hit until velocity reaches a, a certain low and then they, then they stop them that velocity points can be different for everybody. So that's just like the physical part of it, of, of, you know, you reach a point where you're not gaining anything else by, by continuing. So you have to rest until you can uh, recover and then you can build that velocity back up and then go again. So like that, that was my first thought, because even though this is on learning, this, that's just like the, to me, the physical representation of it, or like um, to put it in a different sort of viewpoint or context. Was that, was I pretty close to, yeah, I mean, essentially, and, and I can get, I'll give a, more examples of this, but whenever you're doing something, you want to fail roughly 16% of the time or 15% of the time. And they're just saying that that's kind of the sweet spot of hard enough, but not too hard. Right. And I think that that's really important. I, I mean, I, I really want to use this idea with my kids and teaching them new things because I have encountered that a lot where you know, William might be trying to learn something new and it's way too hard. And so he will just be like, I'm not, no way. But it's because there's like, there was no positive reinforcement from a, an action standpoint. Like he would do something, but he wouldn't see the results. So it doesn't, doesn't matter how much like verbal positive reinforcement I give him. It, that's irrelevant because if he doesn't actually see the result of the actions that he's taking, then he's not going to want to continue. And I see this play out over and over again, but he's okay with failing or if there's something not working out, as long as there is the occasional success. And I think we're all like that. You just see how mm -hmm. human beings should be wired for success. It's like, I'm okay with things not working out, but I'm not okay with things not working out all the time. Like, there's got to be like a, an acceptable failure rate. And I think that it's very interesting that they put this in the context of learning at that 15% that amount. Yeah. So not only does it help with learning, but I think it ties into motivation as well. Because if you're not you don't feel like you're getting you're getting anywhere then you're just gonna quit or you're just gonna stall or um yeah ashley yeah to be fair like i didn't think i thought 85 percent was kind of high because i feel like we all um they talked about the difference of um like steadily increasing difficulty of training you know whatever whatever that is you know how a teacher introduces a concept and then she'll add something to that concept. Like, can you add on to this concept? And then now you're doing, you know, multiple things with this concept and, you know, whatever it is, you know, I think math equations, I think, you know, music lessons, you know, something like that, where you first learn what all the keys are before you then 
you know, start to get to play and do stuff like that. You know, you learn the theory. Um, and so 85% was actually kind of high in my mind, but I was like, it's true. You need to be able to exactly what you said, have the confidence to then, you know, if you do fail, try again. Um, but I think that the error side, it makes sense to me because I feel like if you don't fail, then you can't really learn from certain situations. You know, I'm thinking of like garage gym athletes. If we always talk about like PR week and whatnot, and if you get stagnant or whatever it is, like sometimes it's like, it's not the failing of like the lift. It's, it's the journey that like you took to try to get there. Right. Are you putting in the work to try to, yes, I want to improve this. And you may not hit that PR, but you may see something else different. You know, you may see that you're able to, you know, move a little quicker with heavier weight, whatever it be. Um, but I liked it. it. I mean, I thought it was kind of cool that they talked about like a Goldilocks um, sweet spot of learning because I never, I guess, thought of it like that. But it makes sense, like why it would work um, for multiple humans. <laughs> yeah. um, I actually found the AI stuff kind of intriguing until it got to all the equations. And then I. Yeah, there's a lot off. of crazy equations in this thing that ultimately are. I'm sure they're helpful somewhere. There was like cosine and tangent, like all these things that I haven't done since calculus. They're hieroglyphics. <laughs> that's basically what they look like well yeah anyways but Jared, uh, what do you think? yeah so i thought the study was awesome and i've kind of put it in context already that in, in more general terms but i think when you bring it down to like specific things like what can you do in the gym to try and make sure that you have that 85 percent success rate but enough failure involved to where you're still engaged still learning because i I do think um, you need to be trying new things in the gym to keep yourself engaged. Like I'm always switching activities like, and I don't mean frequently. I don't mean like day to day. Like I will do cycling for months at a time or running, you know, so I'll, I'll change modalities. I'll train uh, like different lifts and I generally will suck at them. Like I, I'm not good. Like when I first hopped on a road bike, I didn't know how to do it. You know, I know how to ride a bike, but how to be good at cycling are two completely different things. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that if you can't see the nuance in that, uh, then you're not really challenging yourself in your fitness routine. Um, even with running, you know, I bought that uh, Garmin heart rate monitor, like specific for running. And I thought it gave me so, so much cool data that I could also work on, not just use and look at. Like it tells me how much time I spend on my right foot and left foot in my vertical oscillation and all these things. And so I'm actually like on my run, like trying to improve those things. And then like, I could get back and be like, ah, you sucked at that. Like you didn't even, you didn't even do anything different, you know? And it's like, okay, fail. And then the next one I try and like, I try and get better. And so that's, that's how I use a lot of data. That's how I look at things. I'm always trying to, you know, get better at them. And I think that that, that's something that I want to urge uh, all garage gym athletes to look at. Like, just ask yourself right now, like, what do I suck at? Like, what, do, what do I suck at right now? Because you should suck at something and it, it shouldn't be like, you should be constantly failing at something, but what do I suck at either in fitness or life, wherever you want to take that, because you should be learning some sort of new skill. And mm -hmm. I think in fitness, it, you know, it could easily be like Olympic lift. Olympic lift is like a, like golf. You're never going to master it. There's only like, there's only that session and, and how you're, you're doing. Right. And so just, picking up those things and trying to see where you're at. I mentioned in a previous podcast episode how I started um, some like gymnastics stretching routines because I got so bored of like Ramwad and like doing the same three or four stretches all the damn time. And like, you know, and, and to be honest, I was just, I was too comfortable. I was, they were too easy for me. Like I can hold any Ramwad position for five minutes, whatever they want to do. And it's not overly challenging, um, but I can't do shit in comparison to gymnastics and to a gymnast. Um, and like, I'm just really bad at it. And I'm like, this is great. This is a sweet spot that I need. Like when, when I see people on the monkey see monkey do video and you like embarrass me and I wonder how that's even possible. Great. I'm, I'm now failing at stretching, you know, and that wasn't even something I was like really thinking about before. And that's just one small example. Cause I'm only doing that once or maybe twice a week. Um, but I, I look for those things in my training as well. You know, where can I improve? What can I 
uh, get better at and, and where do I currently suck? Because I should, I should be able to answer that question that I do suck at something and I'm trying to get better at it. I just want to be like, oh yeah, I mastered the back squat 10 years ago and it's just the same. Like, okay, we'll try a new variation, you know, try something else. That's a big part of uh, West Side Barbell's approach is like all these constantly, constantly varied uh, movements, you know, constantly rotating movements of, okay, we're doing the, the back squat. Now we're gonna do back squat, toes out, back, back squat, wide stance, back squat, uh, you know, narrow stance, back squat on our box squat. Like they do so many different things. It's, it's impossible to master all the different variations Louis Simmons would have them do. And I think that I, that really applies to your training and something that you could learn, uh, learn from. Yeah. It makes me think of like your Murph challenges that you did, you know, you didn't just start out being really awesome at Murph. You just did a few different things and then, you know, you brought people along the way and challenged them. And then like, I even think daily over decades, like if, there's probably people who are athletes who are terrible at consistency and this is challenging them to get better at consistency. So. Yeah. And, and do be mindful. I think that most people quit too early. Like I agree with, I agree with you, Ashley, like when they were like 85% success, to be honest, my bar is much different. Like I'm, I'm good with like 50, 50 or even the opposite. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm learning something hard, like I'm okay with like failing 85% of the time and only have 15% success because now I know this thing's really challenging and it, that actually gives me more uh, like motivation to want to like try and tackle that. Because one thing I, I know about myself is I despise learning curves. Like I just hate them. <laughs> I want to be on the other side of a learning curve. I hate the ramp up of like of a, of a learning curve. And so I try, no matter what I'm learning, I try and shorten a learning curve to the, like the smallest duration possible. The How much I have to learn is the same. But if I can learn that in like one week as opposed to one year, I'm going to get it done. I'll spend all my free time, like everything, like until it's mastered. And I'm like, thank God that learning curve is behind me because I hate them, you know. And so that's just something that I'm, I'm always trying to do is like shorten those as much as I can. And I think that it's it's something that we can all improve on in, in some way, shape or form. Yeah, it's uh, funny you brought up, you mentioned golf, because that's what I've been doing this year is trying to. Uh, basically learn <laughs> how to play is, yeah for the past like yeah, four months awful. and yeah it's super hard i'm pretty sure i was i it's when you start golf it's it's the inverse of 86 percent failure and 14 percent success um but after a while you like i've definitely started to learn more and um with the learning i switched it to like very instead of just like going and, and swinging and just like seeing what happens i've started to watch videos and break it down to like very specific like first like almost like when you do olympic lifts you have the first pull the second pull the third pull mm -hmm. that's kind of what i've been starting to do with golf to where like okay i'm gonna figure out this first little part first this first like wrist flick first and then i'll go to the next one and then i'll go to the next one so as i went through i was like okay i did it right that time so now i'll string these two things together and it's still it's, there's gonna be growing pains for a long time but every time i yeah, go like i've got 40 better years yeah <laughs> but it, i'll see i'll always be challenged no, that's great. That's why so many people like golf. Like if you just like mastered the swing in a few weeks and you know, everything was par, people would be like, I don't know if I want to play this anymore. It's like too easy, you know, but the fact that you can have a great day and then a shitty day is what I think makes golfing continue to happen. People are like, ah, oh, maybe next time. It's not even whole days. It's just like holes. Oh, the hole. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This first hole. Yeah. Great. Second hole. Nope. Lost a couple balls. I've I'm done. I barely play golf generally only when I'm forced in some sort of situation. And that wasn't that long ago. Um, my brother-in-law had a bachelor party. Yeah. In March and I had to golf. I'm just good enough at golf to not embarrass myself. Like you wouldn't golf with me and be like, well, who is this guy? Like, why do we bring him? Like I'm better than that, but I'm also the whole, the whole guy. Like you're saying, like, I think I got like birdie on a hole and they're like, holy shit. I'm like, no, 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 don't, don't worry about that. And then the next one was like, I don't know, 17 over par, something stupid. Like I just didn't even know like what I was doing. Um, I'm kidding. It wasn't that bad, but it was, it was like much worse. They're like, Oh, I thought you were good. I'm like, no, it'll, it'll vary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It'll, it'll see. You'll see. Uh, so yeah. I drive the golf cart. <laughs> yeah. I actually That's asked if I could do that. I was like, can I just, no, like, nah, you got to play. So. Oh Lord. All right. Well, we'll get into the topic. I think it's enough to study. Very cool, though. Do check out the uh, the show notes if you want to see the full breakdown then on this. If you're like, I would say 
in education or coaching or anything like that. Like, I think this is a uh, really beneficial to kind of implement, um, either with, with people you're teaching or coaching. What's up guys. Did you know that I wrote a book kind of crazy that it's out there and I almost never talk about it. The book is called killing comfort. And what you may not know is that I just lowered the price of the book to the lowest allowable level on Amazon. And you might be asking, why would I do such a thing? And the answer is because I want to put my money where my mouth is and prove I am here to help as many people as I possibly can. And I won't have the price of the book stand in the way. It's also on Audible, if you want to hear me read it, but I can't actually adjust the price there. It's automatically set by Amazon on that platform. Either way, you can go to Amazon or KillingComfort.com and get the book at its lowest possible price. If you like the book, I'd love a positive review and five-star rating if you see fit on Amazon. Leaving your review is a great way to help us help more people. All right, back to the show. And today's topic happens to be about the book that you just heard about. Uh, I just felt like they, the study's talking about the 85% rule. We got the 86% rule in the book Killing Comfort. Um, so you can go grab a book. Uh, I mentioned it in the mid-roll, but I think, um, I mean, it's as cheap as it can possibly get right now. Like Amazon, they have like low the lowest prices based off of how many megabytes the ebook is and like how the the lowest price they can do for paperback copies based off of how many actually pages they need to print and i dropped them to the lowest lowest level um so for company wide there's like no profit involved um uh, if i went any cheaper we'd have to pay them and i don't even know if they they'd actually allow you to do it but i don't want to go that direction so really go grab the book um to be honest ever since we made that switch um, a ton of Killing Comfort books are are moving. So I appreciate all the all the listeners who are getting it. I really just want the book to impact as much as many people as as possible. Um, book royalties and income are not a big source of revenue here. Um, I, I've talked about this before. Like it really, you have to be John Maxwell to live off your book revenue. Like anyone else uh, might be making some income, but it's not. If you have like a, another legitimate business and you're not an author, um, it's not it's not uh, not going to happen. So go grab the book. Um, I put a lot into it, and we're going to be talking about the 86 today. And I think I can sum it up pretty fast here. I'm going to read a few paragraphs um, from one of the opening chapters about 86% failure. So the the wolf, while often portrayed as near mythical beasts, wolves are failures. For centuries, the wolf has inspired legends around the world in spite of the fact that the one thing a wolf does more than anything else is fail. If you look at the numbers, 86% of the time a wolf steps foot on a hunt, it will fail. So six out of seven times, it comes up short, gets nothing, and goes hungry. Furthermore, one victory doesn't mean the hunt is over, because there's still tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, and the day after that. Wolves fail more than they succeed, but despite their rare 14% success rate, they have a momentous impact on the surrounding ecosystem. And I, I go on to explain in, in the rest of that chapter how, how much they truly can impact their uh, the ecosystem in a lot of different ways, but they're like just straight up failures. Like they, they barely <laughs> like they barely get an animal when they go hunt. Like everyone thinks a wolf is like so badass, but a wolf's like if you could hear their self talk, they're probably like, damn it. Like again, like I just another hunt, no food, starving might eat a human. So anyway, we're going to be talking about that a little bit more uh, today because I think you have to fail quite a bit. And this is almost the inverse of, of what the 85% rule was talking about. But I, I think that that might be closer to the truth when we are talking about success. And that's what this book was about um, or is about. So when we're talking about learning, I kind of agree with their Okay, yeah, maybe 15% uh, of the time you need to fail. But I think when you're actually trying something that's really, really hard, um, whether that be some sort of physical achievement, whether that be business, you know, whatever you are trying to do, you're going to fail a lot more than you succeed. And it there's a different mentality you have to take on, on getting through that. Um, 
I'm I'm not going to sit here and talk about it too much. I've already been talking a lot. I, I'd, I'd love to know your general thoughts on, you know, embracing failure when you're trying to succeed or, or getting something you want out of life. Uh, I know we've all done a, a lot of different things that uh, weren't easy to accomplish, but I, I would just love to know what, what you guys general thoughts are on, on the idea. Um, I think I love particularly the part where you say change yourself. Because again, I feel like this is about growth, right? Like this is what you said, like success. Um, and I necessarily like don't look at this just with business, but like even with relationships, you know, sometimes uh, I think we all can have difficult relationships, whether that be your family or friends or peers or whatever it may be. Um, and that's what I love about this whole book is like it it's about, you know, growing, but to do so, it's going to cause yourself to have to have a little bit of pain here. And, and I think this, I said, what a brilliant way to start a book. Like this book is not about, I loved how you said, like, this is not about how like pick yourself up again and do it again. And you can do it. You know, this is, you're going to have to look at yourself and look inward and that's going to be painful. And you have to do the hard stuff in order to grow. And I think that's where the most growth happens you know when you're down at that bottom point and you know you feel kind of like man can I do this but then there's something at the end of the tunnel and you you see um the effects and I love how you said the effects around you will change mm -hmm. when you change yourself you know it's not like you're trying to change um pot potentially things that you can't even control you know um but you're not even trying to change your surroundings like you're changing a part of you, which I feel like all of us naturally don't want to go to that painful point. You know, I feel like we avoid that for the most part. We're like, mm, this is not comfortable. I'm just going to stay away from this, you know, and that's, I feel like people naturally try to keep away from that. And um, I think it is good to, to have to do that and, and see like, oh man, like what what am I made of and am I going to keep going in order to get better and to grow out of this, I guess? Um, yeah, I said, I think it rings true to, I love the prize hunting. Um, Jared talks about how like you say, if I just get to this one point, I feel like I've been feeling this way a lot, which is maybe why I honed in on it. If I just get past all this nausea, I can then, you know, whatever, or like, if I just get this car, or if I just get this one thing in my job, then I'm going to be happy. And I feel like you hit the nail on the head where you said, you're happy for like two seconds. And then it's like the next thing you feel like that that doesn't quite satisfy you, you know, and I feel like a lot of it has to do inwardly, right? Like, are you, um, you know, are you using outside things to, to cope with other things, I guess? Um, anyways, I feel like how many times have, you know, we all done that probably. Um, I'll stop talking because I feel like I could just no, go on. <laughs> I, I mean, I think I love, I love these conversations, you know, because I, I wrote the book, right. And, and I think um, you only, you get to write the book and you have to communicate to people through the languages that are on the pages. And then there's the audio book where, yeah, I, re I read it, but it, it's ultimately the same type of, of thing. Right. But um, being able to like dive into these a little bit deeper, because I've, I have gotten some pushback on like, the 86% thing where I do say, look, just change yourself and, and watch things change around you. Um, because people think that I mean, like, you know, don't help friends out or like whatever else, <laughs> but that, that's not necessarily what it means, but it also, it, it could mean that like, it, it just means like you need to take care of your yourself first. And I think going to your relationship point that it's so true because I, what I see a lot of people do, and I, I don't give out a lot of relationship advice. Okay. But what I do see a lot of people do is when they're in a situation in a relationship where they're not totally happy, they start pointing out all the things that either the other person can do to fix things or how the situation can be different. There's never a lot of ownership when people are un unhappy in a relationship. And my take has always been in relationships. I'm just going to improve. Like I'm just going to get better. Like you should not have to ever accept anything of me as like, that's the way I am. If I'm bad at it, my plan is to get better at it. Like you just need to let me know that I'm bad at it and I will continue to get better at it. And so I also don't get, take a lot of offense in my relationship. If Emily is like, Hey, you suck at doing this thing. I'm like, 
that's great to know. Now I can get better at it, you know? <laughs> and so that's what, that that's how I, I look at these things. Like in a relationship is like, you just, just work on yourself. And, and it doesn't mean be selfish. It just means if you really want to lead, like in your family, then be a leader in your family. Don't, mm -hmm. don't like point out how everything's broken. Like go be the leader that you feel is lacking as opposed to wishing someone else would do it. Like you just, just do it. You're the only person who's going to be able to do it. Um, and I think that that is something on the relationship standpoint, I don't get to talk about as much because we are always talking about fitness and everything else, but I feel like I push myself outside of fitness, um, you know, and family life and everything else in those areas. Um, and you know, on your other point, it's so true. Like you have to, you have to learn to enjoy the journey. And that's something I'm also bad at, but try to remember like, cause I'm always future casting, like, <laughs> what's what's next like what what do i need to achieve what's the next thing and i can often forget like your kids are just happy here and now um you know and uh who this was um who wrote uh ego is the enemy what's his name ryan holiday yeah i think you're right. he he talks about um he does this uh parenting thing now it's called like the daily dad or stoic dad or something like that hmm. but he talks about how there is no such thing as quality time like there's no like oh you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna go pick up my son from school today and we're gonna go on this like date and it's gonna be great quality time now that absolutely can be the truth i'm not saying that's not true but your kids are happy with basically any time they get mm -hmm. with you it's all quality time there's no like oh this is my designated quality time it's like <laughs> No, if, if it's not designated, what does that give you an excuse to sit there and play on your phone while your kid stares at you like that? It's all the same. It's all time. You just have time with your kids. And he points that out. And I think that that's huge. It's like, I, you know, I don't want to always be like, okay, when we go on this vacation, we're going to have a lot of fun and it's going to be amazing. It's like, William's cool sitting on the couch, like figuring out a Rubik's cube with me. Like that, these are the things he'll remember, you know? And so I think those are the things that I have to tell myself as well. Like there doesn't always have to be this big event or next thing. Like you can just just be and, and it's just as important you know and you gotta enjoy the, the journey more than the destination hmm. yeah so when it comes to 86 and i think it applies it's i guess it's a uh, focus toward starting something new doing something new and growing and whenever you do something like that i think two of the two of the main things that come to mind to me are expectations and motivation and because you're starting something new you should expect to fail and if you don't expect to fail, if you don't expect to have, you know, to kind of lower a bar, then you're not going to be motivated and you're probably going to give up. So going back to the the study and the chart, if you have low skill on something, you should only challenge yourself a little bit. You shouldn't, if you have low skill on something, you shouldn't be just challenging yourself. I mean, unless you're Jared to just <laughs> kick ass at it right away. So, But if, if you already have some skill at it and as you develop skill, then you challenge yourself as you go. But you still should expect that you you shouldn't take on too much at once and that you're going to fail either way regardless and it shouldn't take away from your motivation because that's just how things are and it's definitely easy to get stuck in a comfort zone i notice this with us like every couple of weeks or or months i'll notice that we'll we'll start doing something we've all whether it's food prep like yeah even just food prep or routine and i was like okay this is what we're doing and i'll think back to like a year before and i was like oh wait i used to do this and this, why did I stop doing that? And I think it would just be like, well, this was just a lot easier to do. So I just started doing it that way. Right. And then I'm like, well, maybe I should go back to doing what I was doing before because I don't need to go back. To, I don't need to have this be so easy. I can still do what I was doing before. And then maybe I can start something on top of that. But so like, yeah, just having that expectation and um, not getting down about for, for your, your motivation. Um, it's also once you like, once you start to learn something, if you really nailed it, that down, then you become more comfortable with that. And then you can add a little bit more and then add a little bit more. Um, but you're still still need to have a slower approach um, to it. Yeah, I think it's really funny. This is like brainwashing in, uh, in pilot training that they do. They have this like, um, I think he was like the, the base, like psychologist or something they, like studied he had like two main things. He studied all the uh, pilot trainees and like he did a lot of psychological testing and everything else. But then he also was like a world renowned expert at getting people to get, to overcome um, 
motion sickness. Like if they, hmm. if, because you can get you kicked out of pilot training. Like they'll, right. they'll, they'll like deal with you for a little bit, but then after a certain amount of time, they'll be like, okay, well, can't throw up every time. Like, you know, so um, that's what this guy did. But anyway, they, it was like the first week they give this big presentation on stress. And he was talking about knowing the line uh, of stress. Like you really need to know where the line is because it's, it's very similar to the things that we're talking about the, the research he presented, because it was like, if you are not stressed enough, there will not be a lot of results and you won't get better at flying. You won't, you won't pro progress, but then there's the overwhelming amount of stress to where you have too much anxiety and too much stress to where you actually can't perform that well because your level of anxiety and stress is hurting your ability to perform. So that's, that's too much. You need to learn how to mitigate that. And it's called you stress E U S T R E S S. I think, um, you can, you can look it up. So you stress is where you're stressed at the proper amount to where your performance is still progressing. And I think that there's been a huge, shift in society to think that we need to be at the no stress level mm -hmm. in our lives to where we're just like you don't really need stress like let's cut it out get all that out who needs stress <laughs> but you actually need it now you can have too much too much causes the stress and anxiety that can actually be really bad for your health as well um, and you got to be in that middle zone to where it's like this is just stressful enough to where i'm achieving it i'm making progress and I can see myself getting better at it, but I'm, I'm not there. Like I'm not perfect. And you know, I'm not, not going to ever be perfect. And, and you need that level of stress in your life. And I think, um, th this goes for this principle in killing comfort. It goes for the study we talked about earlier. You need to find that, that level of stress in your life. And this can be, this can be anywhere personally, professionally, like your career. Like if you're just, if, if you're not at a slight speed wobble, um, at, at times, then you're probably not pushing yourself. And everybody got the speed waffle reference? Yes. <laughs> okay, good. They were good. So yeah, I, I think that, that that's really important. Yeah, when I think that's why people don't go out of their they don't, well, don't try these new things and because you know it's, people already have a, a certain amount of stress now. So who wants to add more stress to something? But if I when I do something new, if I if I try to do do some anything and if I didn't have, if there was, it wasn't any sort of stress or challenge to it, I don't feel like I accomplished pretty much anything. Like if I were to just go and um, like, it, it, I guess go back to golf, I would just go to the range and be like, yeah, I can drive the ball, you know, 300 yards. Cool. I probably would just be like, cool, I can do that. I don't probably don't see feel the need to go back and keep, keep working on it or doing it. But if I suck at it and then I keep going and each time I get better, then I feel accomplished every time I've gone and gotten better, even though there is some stress to it and there's still, you know, you still have to, um, like I said before, lower your expectations some, but it still gives you a sense of accomplishment. And I just, yeah, back to people just are avoiding so much stress now. And I mean, this a kind of a pet peeve of mine is that n nowadays people think that all stress is automatically anxiety. People throw around the the word anxiety way too much. Like they they have a really stressful day, and they're just like, oh my god, I just, I just my my anxiety is acting up. Like no you probably are just stressed. You're not, you don't actually have anxiety. People with anxiety, like can't move and are in the fetal position, but stress is just like, you're just, you're just stressed. You had a hard day. It happens. You, so yeah. this sort of 86 might actually help people with the perspective of, okay, that's stress. This is how we manage stress. I'm not, I don't have anxiety. I think anxiety is the line where, um, cause it can, it can be derived from the same thing. Like you can have, a career that is the perfect amount of stress to where you're making progress and seeing results and all that stuff, but it can push over that line to where it gives you anxiety. And I, I feel like it's like uh, when it becomes chronic and uncontrolled is where you can probably get to the anxiety state, you yeah. know? Um, and I think if you don't like, I, I think to be honest, personally, I think if I didn't have a lot of tools in the toolbox to manage, um, myself my mental the mental part of me like i would probably suffer from anxiety because um i mean i meditation sauna cold pools fitness like i i'm pulling out like if a if a psychologist were like hey here's how you can manage anxiety 
It was like, I could probably have a checkbox on all of them. I'm just like, <laughs> wait, I'm just doing all of them. Right. Uh, but I think that's because I just also know, like I, I am a more high strung person in general. Like I want everything to be serious and I want to be good at everything. And like, mm-hmm. that's how I want to be. And so like, I have to combat that. I have to do the opposite. I have to downregulate. I have to be different than, than my natural tendencies. And, and that can be difficult. So I think that if you don't have those tools in the toolbox, you could easily like click over to having an anxiety problem for sure. All right. Uh, the last thing I'll say, so we've kind of talked about the opening chapter. Definitely go check it out. Um, there's also an entire process. It's called the 86% process. That's chapters 13 through 18. Where I talk about all these things, focus, grit, balance, essential habits, mistakes. So definitely check it out if you want to go into this a lot in a lot more detail. I mean, that's basically what the rest of the book is about. And I think that if you are someone who struggles with you know, pushing yourself uh, or sticking to things. This book has a lot of solutions for you. And then for all the people who think that they're, you know, arrogant and, and good at those things, it has ways <laughs> <Read the book. laughs> to, to, to push you as well, because you're probably, you're probably just stroking your ego by pointing out the things that you're good at and ignoring all the things that you're actually bad at in your life. Um, and so definitely check out the book again, zero profit going to us. And I know, I know the the community wouldn't care that much if profit was going um, to the to the company, but it's just that I did that more as a gesture. Like I want to get uh, the book out there to as many people as I can because one thing I really don't believe in uh, is free. I don't believe in free, and that's not because we need the money. I, I don't believe in free because people don't take action on free. Hmm. People just don't. They. I mean, I've had way too many example cases of that being the case. Once it's free. No, no one cares anymore. There's no value to it, whatever. So if you have to at least spend a, a dollar to five dollars or whatever it costs, you at least invested something. You'll take it slightly more serious than you would had you had I just given you the book. Uh, and so definitely, definitely go check it out. Uh, but we can get into the Meet Yourself Saturday. Ashley's got it. What are we what are we doing? It's to Carlo. Um, it is a memorial workout for Anne who passed away with leukemia a little bit ago and she was a garage gym athlete and, um, and it's a breathing ladder. So, um, when I hear the word breathing ladder, I'm always like, this is gonna suck. Uh, it is an ascending to descending breathing ladder. So you go from one rep and then all the way up to 15 and then back down all the way down to one. Um, but you'll do one rep of the kettlebell. Then you'll do a burpee and then you'll do a double under. Then you'll take a breath. Then you go up to two of all of those things, all the way up to 15, all the way back down. Um, and it says, if the breathing prescription is not sustainable, mark where you failed and then continue breathing as normal and complete the workout. Um, and the recommendation is to go light on a kettlebell. So if you're normally swinging like a 53 pound for men or 35 for women, probably scale down from there. Yeah. I'll just say that I made the, like the exercise selections were not on accident. They are all high metabolic demand, high oxygen consumption. So this should be a speed wobble breathing ladder (laughs) for most people at some point. Like I don't expect many people to be honest, to do an ascending and descending ladder of one to 15 and back down with those three movements, especially if you're doing it right. So it should be very challenging, challenging workout. So just keep that in mind as you go through this. Yeah. I said, I like to re- always reflect why we do this. Right. We talked mm-hmm. about, you know, about Ian and um, I did say that it was a duty, but breathing ladders are so tough and I love how it makes you focus on such a simple thing like breathing. You know, we do it every day, <laughs> but at the same time, it also like challenges you to, you know, obviously focus on that one thing. Uh, for me, I do this in silence. I, I know I'm the music mm-hmm. person. But I can't with the cadence in a background because then I'll start breathing in that cadence. It's really funny how my brain works with music, which is why I know it's so beneficial sometimes. But in a workout like this, for me, I have to do this one in silence or any breathing ladder for that matter when we do kettlebell breathing ladders. So I recommend that for anybody who needs to. Joe, (laughs) sorry. Yeah, really fight the urge to inhale and like just like breathing faster during your your breaths Mm -hmm. you really want to make make those count 
uh, deep breaths. And I definitely struggled with this at the, even at the four or five mark, like mm -hmm. that's when, that's when my heart, heart rate started to get up. And that's when my body's like, you need to breathe more. And I'm like, well, I, I, I actually need to like breathe better. And it's just like that <laughs> really have to fight that on, for a couple of rounds. Yeah. And I get, I get a little bit better at it. I get so used to the point like, okay, I'm just used to, you know, feeling a little dizzy for the first couple of breaths. Um, so yeah, really fight that urge. And whenever I do these breathing ladders as well, try and rest as much as you can during those moments. So we did a study a while back about putting your hands on your knees, not hands on your um, head, hands on your knees better for recovery. I will sometimes have a, my plyo box nearby and sit on the box and head and lean, lean kind of forward onto my knees as well while I breathe. Cause it also helps to um, get my arms away from my chest so that I can just breathe more free and a little bit more of a, in a rested position to try and bring my heart rate down as much as possible uh, during those rest periods to make those count as much as possible. That's what my question was going to be. I was like, can you take a full big diaphragm breath leaning over? But I guess you just said, yeah. Yeah. Back. Cause I'm kind of like, it, it, I'm, I'm not like completely leaned over. It's almost just like a, okay. maybe even a 45 degree angle. Um, Cause I'm still sitting up kind of high to where my knees are. Um, mm. I'm not like hunched down. Fetal position is the best for recovery. Anyone was wondering <laughs> that for one breath. <laughs> I mean, when it gets to 10, I'm not saying I don't do it. <laughs> it's just, that one's, I, one's good up there. Yeah. I just prefer the seat because when you're in the fetal position, you still have to stand up and get back to where you're doing it. Unless, like, I feel like this came up before because since the first thing's a burpee, you can just roll over and start your burpee. That's true. I mean, you're not wrong. <laughs> fetal position it is. I, I designed no, it for that. With it's the a science sweet. Oh, yeah, it is. Oh. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's totally. You, womp womp. And how about you're allowed to change the order if you want to try the fetal position resting for science? Cool. Yeah, for science. Um, all right. I think I think that's it. I don't have any other tips. I mean, we kind of talked about it. The only one we always talk about with the breathing ladder is you can breathe as, how you want during the exercise. People always ask that question. They're like, they think that there's a, supposed to be a number or a set number of breaths when you're doing the work. When you're doing the work, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's in between. So, like, breathe as normal when you're doing the work, and then oh, okay. you do the yeah, breathing. Right. I was like, what? Yeah, you do the... No, yeah, this is a big, big point of confusion. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> make sure that you you got that. But uh, other than that, I think that's that's all for this week. For all of our garage gym athletes out there uh, listening, watching on YouTube, uh, you know, buying the book, all of it, much appreciated. Your activity in the Facebook group, everything. We really. Uh, you know, appreciate you guys uh, being a part of the community and making it as awesome as it is. If anyone is listening who'd like to be uh, a, a member of our training, you can go to garagemathlete.com, sign up for a 14-day free trial. If you'd like to a little bit easier intro into our mindset and community, go snag Killing Comfort from Amazon um, and, and check it out. Uh, but that's it for this one. Remember, if you don't kill comfort, comfort will kill you. Athlete Podcast. If you want to learn more, go to garagegymathlete.com. You can learn about our training. Let us send you a copy of our book, The Garage Gym Athlete, or you can even get featured on the Garage Gym Athlete Podcast. Thanks for listening.